Every sane Israeli hawk understood that it was absurd for Israel to leave 8,000 settlers in Gaza, protected by a large part of the army, while taking over scarce water resources and arable land. The sane conclusion was to withdraw from Gaza while expanding through the West Bank, and that will continue as long as Washington insists on marching on the road to catastrophe by rejecting minimal Palestinian rights. I'm quoting the warning of the four former heads of Israel's Shin Beit Security Service. There are clear alternatives, and if that march to catastrophe continues, we will have only ourselves to blame. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. In the spirit of discussion of this form, we are now going to open the floor to your questions. So there are four microphones, one here, uh, one got it there, uh, one here in the uh, intermediate stage, and one uh, on the floor directly uh, in front of me. We're going to proceed as follows, and so I want you to listen carefully to uh, respect the civility of the discourse that I intend to make sure that we follow here. I'm going to ask you to uh, introduce yourself and to ask just one question. As the dean of our school always reminds people, questions end with a question mark. And out of respect for all of our colleagues and students here this evening waiting patiently at the mics, I will insist on only one brief question. I would also ask that you, where appropriate, direct your question to one of the panelists. After that panelist responds, I will invite his colleague for a brief comment, and then we will return to the floor. So that you know what's coming, I will begin over here, go up, across, and then back down. Um, hi, my name is Mishi Harman. I'm from Jerusalem, and this is a uh, question for Professor Chomsky. I wanted to know if you think that it actually is relevant to dwell upon forming a, a shared narrative of both sides in 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 going forth towards any any solution of peace between us. Is it important for us to actually agree what 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 48 represents for one one side and what 48 represents for the other in order to live together in peace in the future? Yes, I think it's very relevant to understand history if you want to understand the present. Mm -hmm. Professor Dershowitz, a comment. I agree, and I think the history has to be objectively verifiable, and it doesn't become true because Professor Chomsky says it's true. There was a two-state solution proposed by the United Nations in 1948. And if the Palestinians had accepted what the Israelis accepted, a small, non-contiguous state with Bantistans, to quote Professor Chomsky, and instead had not invaded, and if the Egyptians had not occupied the Gaza, something that nobody complained about, it was literally a prison for 20 years, and if the Jordanians hadn't occupied the West Bank, literally a prison for 20 years, and had the situation gone forward as it was supposed to go forward in 48, we would not be here. We'd have a two-state solution. But what happened is it's clear that the Palestinian and Arab leadership was more interested in destroying the nascent Jewish state of Israel than in establishing a Palestinian state. That is simply the truth. And there is no way to deny that. And no amount of rhetoric can undercut that reality. You'll notice that it starts with 1948, okay. and I'd be glad to discuss that if you like, though it's not relevant. Okay. I began with 1967 for a good reason, because it's in 1967 that UN 242 was passed, and a framework <laughs> was laid for peace settlements, and since then it's the way it's described. Well, let me briefly respond, only because I, was, whoa, whoa. I participated in the drafting in a small way of 242. I was Arthur Goldberg's assistant at the Supreme Court. He drafted 242. He conferred with me and consulted with me. 242 clearly contemplated Israel retaining some of the territories needed to create secure boundaries 
in 1967. The, uh, the UN rejected a formulation of Israel returning all the territories or the territories and kept only territories. And as the result of that, Israel accepted 242. And at Khartoum, all the Arab states and the Palestinians unanimously rejected 242 and issued their three no's. No, no compromises, no recognition, no peace. If we can just, the truth of the matter is if we can discovered just, uh, from if we the can just foreign relations of the United States, which okay, points yeah. out that Professor Arthur Goldberg Chomsky. approached the Jordanians and the others yeah. and agree, got them to agree to, uh, uh, to accept a qualified acceptance okay. of 242 on the condition that there would be minor and mutual adjustments with no substantial change to the map. Okay. There were curved lines, and it was agreed that they should be straight. All right. What you can't see behind the podium is that both of my colleagues are armed with several dozen maps, and that could get, <laughs> that could, that could get dangerous in this part of the conversation. So I'm going to ask uh, for some restraint so we make sure that we go directly to our participants. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ken Sweeter. Uh, I'd like to bring it to the present, and I'd like to ask Professor Dershowitz, since this was a major point made by Professor Chomsky, whether or not you believe Israel is ready to negotiate for a contiguous state, not one of three separate Bantu stands. Yes. Uh, now, contiguous depends, of course, on whether it means contiguous within the West Bank or contiguous including a connection between the West Bank and the Gaza. Now, it was the UN that created the lack of contiguity between the Gaza Strip and the uh, West Bank. In fact, the original proposals for Israel required complete non-contiguity. The north was separated from Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv from Jerusalem, yet Israel accepted a non-contiguous state. Under the Clinton parameters, there would be complete contiguity with a circumferential highway around Jerusalem, much like Route 128. It would take nine extra minutes to get from Ramallah to Bethlehem, then in the middle of the night through Jerusalem, because the shortest distance between two lines taking into account traffic is not a straight line. Now there are all kinds of creative proposals for functional contiguity between the West Bank and Gaza, including a high-tech rail line recently designed by the Rand Foundation. I have a picture of that in, the, in my book. It also looks much like the Danish railroad, a high-tech waterway, all kinds of ways of connecting all the Palestinian states to, uh, cities to each other. Under this proposal, no point in Palestine would be more than 90 minutes away from any other point in Palestine, including Gaza. It would take 34 minutes to get from Hebron to Gaza City on the rail line. That is functional contiguity. And the fact that the leader of the Labor Party for years has quit his party to join a new party, and the leader of Likud has quit his party, both in the interest of making peace, persuades me. Plus an hour I had alone in Israel not so long ago with Prime Minister Sharon and much time that I've spent with former Prime Minister Perez that the will toward peace is absolute and genuine. Having said that, I also believe the will to peace by Abbas and many of the leaders of the Palestinian Authority is genuine too. Thank God Israel has to make peace with the Palestinians and not with the professors. Okay. Uh, uh, comment from, from uh, Professor you, Chomsky. For those of you who want to see the maps that lie behind Mehran Benvenisti's and Sarah Roy's and Human Rights Watch and the European Union and other comments, I have them here. But there's a very simple test that we could try. Let's, if, those are, if that's a valid approach to contiguity for the Palestinian state, in 22% of the former Palestine, let's propose it for the Israeli state uh, in 78% of the former Palestine. Let's ask who would dream of proposing that. It was proposed. The Peel yeah. Commission proposed Sorry. exactly now, that, and Israel now, accepted it. In 1937, but well, you in know, a relevant period, let's when, say, right, when, we're talking about today. When today, thousands, uh, who would gentlemen. propose that for Israel? Gentlemen. When Obviously thousands of people have been killed by terrorism, yeah. you don't expect a country to go back to a proposal that was offered and rejected many, many years earlier. Options change when rejectionism sets in. Okay, let's go to our next uh, question. Coming back to 2005, you mentioned the connection between, oh, sorry, Professor Dashwitz. My name is Talal Salman, by the way. 
But you, you mentioned the, uh, the connection between Gaza and West Bank. Right. But I think to follow up on my, on, the, on my colleague, I'm not sure if this is what he meant, what about the pieces of West Bank we're going to end up with? <coughs> okay, Settlements are continuing to be built inside the West Bank. The wall is being built inside the borders of 1967. So now please talk to me about peace, about pro-Palestine, when it comes to building walls and actually separating the West Bank from East Jerusalem. Okay, here's what a Palestinian state would have looked like had Camp David and Taba been accepted. It would be a completely contiguous West Bank with an area that, including Ma'alea Dumim and some of the other areas right side of Jerusalem, which would become part of Israel and would remain within the wall. The ultimate goal is to have a separation fence that is on the border the accepted border. And I'll tell you what I think the real options are today. The real options are, if this new peace party wins, if the Sharon Paris peace party wins, it will offer the Palestinians a very good deal, a deal much like that what was rejected at Camp David and Taba. And by the way, if you think it was the Israelis who rejected it, just ask Bill Clinton. Uh, he has told me, Dennis Ross has told me, it was completely in the fall, completely in the hands of the uh, Arafat, and that's true of Prince Bandar as well. But if it gets accepted this time, um, there, and if the peace party prevails again, they will be offered something very, very close to that. It will be a viable Palestinian state, much more viable than anything Israel was offered and accepted in 38 and in 47. And I think every reasonable person today would urge the Palestinians not to repeat the disastrous mistakes they made in 48, they made in 67, they made in 2000, they made in 2001. This time say yes, accept the Palestinian state, build it, create an economy, create a political system, and finally peace can be achieved. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. For those who you would like to see the map, I have it. It's, as I said, from Ron Pundak, the leading Israeli scholar, the head of the Shimon Peres Peace Center. Uh, it shows, uh, this is the Camp David map, which was, which Clinton recognized was impossible, which is why they went on to Taba. Uh, and it cuts through the West Bank completely. Uh, it's not that. It's, it is, here it is. is. Here it is. This is Ron no, okay. Pundak's map. That's the one the Palestinians We know Sorry. everyone can Ron see them Pundak clearly. Ron Pundak is not a Palestinian. He's the head of the Shimon Peres Peace This is Peace Dennis Center. Ross's map. Yes, Dennis Ross was the U.S. negotiator. That's whose right. word is meaningless. Uh, Ron, Pundak is, Ron Pundak is the leading Israeli scholar, uh, and if, if you want to go into why Ross's book is worthless, I'll be happy to say it. It's obvious to any reader. It stops You know, right what's obvious to you stops, is not obvious to other people. It's, well, I'll tell you why. It stops, notice that his book stops immediately before Taba. Why? Because Clinton's parameters and what Clinton said about the acceptance of them by both sides and the Taba negotiations completely undermines Dennis Ross's book. So he therefore terminates it right before that and can therefore make these absurd claims. But if you want to learn something about it, look at Israeli scholarship. It's much more serious. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank both professors for speaking so eloquently tonight. My name is Josh Suskowitz. I'm a recent alum of Harvard College, and I'm really glad to be back. Um, I have sort of a simple question for Professor Chomsky. It seems to me that you left out in your analysis the element of violence, psychological, physical, against Israel, against Jews. Um, and it seems to me also that the history that Professor Dershowitz has described, a lot of that is dictated by what, what happened, the terrorism, the wars against Jews, especially considering the immediate history um, right before the establishment of the State of Israel, the Holocaust, and everything that has happened since. So I'd like you to address um, the effect of, the psychological effect and the physical effect of war and terrorism on Israel. Well, that's a half of a very important question. The other half of it is what's the effect of war and terrorism on the Palestinians? Uh, now, if you take a look at, we're not supposed to talk about that question here, but if you look at them both, you'll find that uh, what Benny Morris described is in fact correct. Uh, the balance of terror and violence is overwhelmingly against the Palestinians, not surprisingly, given the balance of forces. And that's even true, that's true right to the present. I mean, for, you know, for decades, uh, Israel was able to run the West Bank virtually with 
no forces, as Morris point and others point out, because the population was so passive. While they were being humiliated, beaten, tortured, land stolen, and so on, just as I quoted. Uh, finally, there was a reaction. And it's interesting to see the U.S. reaction to it. In the first month of the Intifada, this one, uh, October uh, 2000, in the first month of the Intifada, uh, two, uh, 75 Palestinians, 74 Palestinians were killed. Four Israelis were killed. It's all in the occupied territories. Uh, the Israeli army, according to its own records, fired a million bullets in the first day, which disgusted the generals when they learned about it. Uh, Israel, the first few days of the Intifada, was using U.S. helicopters. They don't make them. U.S. helicopters to attack civilian complexes, apartment houses and so on, killing and wounding dozens of people. And the U.S. did respond to that. Clinton responded by sending the biggest shipment of military helicopters in a decade to Israel. Uh, the press responded, too, by not publishing it. I should add, refusing to publish it because it was repeatedly brought to their attention. Well, while the ratio was 20 to 1, which is pretty much what it's been for a long time, there was no concern here. Then over the next two, three years, the ratio reduced to closer to 3 to 1. And then came enormous concern about the 1, not the 3. And this goes back for a long time. What I quoted from Mars is accurate. Well, you know, uh, no, no follow-up, a very brief response. The idea that there is this vast conspiracy between the American media and both Democrats like Clinton and Republicans like Bush to hide the truth from the American public just does not bear reality. Israel is an open society. Any newspaper can come and cover it. Why would not the newspapers cover these stories? Well, for one reason, they are figments of Chomsky's imagination. Well, then if and they just <laughs> never happen. Now, I want to talk about another figment of his imagination. For Chomsky those who constantly want to verify quotes, them, constantly you... quotes, constantly quotes right. Benny Morris as if Benny Morris supports his position. What happened is Benny Morris was asked whether or not I accurately quote him in my book, The Case for Peace, and Benny Morris responded as follows. Um, he still holds the views that I attributed uh, to him, that I am right about his views, and that someone could read Morris's books, this is a quote from Morris, and arrive at exactly the same conclusions. And yet, Professor Chomsky, by selectively quoting and by picking tidbits out of context, knowing that you're not going to check up on him, tells you essentially that what you believe in the American media, whether it be the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, or the New York Times, is not true. In order to get the true meaning of the world, you have to move to planet Chomsky, where the news reflects his perspective on reality. Well, I urge you to move to the real world. Read the real news. Don't yeah. read the selective Israeli journalist that he talks about. Listen to Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross okay. actually helped to draw the maps. Professor he Dershowitz. was there when okay. I, I have to finish. I haven't done my two minutes. When he said, okay. when I asked Dennis Ross at lunch today about these maps and what, what apparently Chomsky would say in response, Ross said, ask Professor Chomsky one thing. Were you there? Dennis okay. Ross was there. He knows what maps were presented to the Palestinians yeah. and what they rejected. Thank you. The Thank head of the Shimon Paris, the head of the Shimon Paris Peace Center, Ron Pundak, who's the leading scholar on this and doesn't cut Whenever it off. Whenever you quote right the leading scholar, he's, how right do we before, know that? Okay. Right before he's refuted the way Dennis Ross did, presents he was involved in negotiations since before Oslo, right through Camp David up to the present. Got a long historical account of it. You can read it if you can read Hebrew. Some of it's in English. Uh, the one, all this smoke that was blown had to do with one fact that I mentioned, one. And you can check it, and please do. In the, er, f in the first month of the Intifada, uh, I'm now using Israeli sources, 74 Palestinians were killed, four Jews in the occupied territories. The first few days... Uh, this is reported in the press here, Boston Globe. Israel was using U.S. helicopters to attack apartment complexes. Clinton reacted with the biggest deal in a decade. Check it out. It's in the public record. Not, it, not questioned by anyone to send uh, military helicopters to Israel. The, there has been a database search of the U.S. It was reported in Europe. 
It was reported by Amnesty International. It's reported in Jane's Defense Weekly, the main military magazine in the world. Uh, there was a database search of the U.S. press, and they found nothing. Uh, I know of explicit cases, and I'll be glad to tell them to you, where the press was approached and asked just to report the facts. Why they didn't zero. they? Chomsky, why didn't they report it? Are they bad reporters? Because What's no. their motive? Explain to, why the Times or the Post they, wouldn't report this great story from Planet Chomsky. Gentlemen, if it's, I could... From uh, James uh, Defense uh, Weekly, uh, from uh, the international press, and so on, yeah. Uh, they wouldn't, you have to ask them why they didn't report it. I'll give you my opinion. Yeah. In fact, I've written about Let's it. Hear. Given that the uh, JFK form is uh, here for the purpose of creating educated citizens and participants uh, in a very important debate, I would ask uh, each of you uh, to exercise a bit of restraint so that we can have more of our questions from the audience, please, and identify yourself. Yeah, Nancy Murray, and uh, if you want the answer, why didn't they report it? See peace propaganda and the promised land. Now, my question, getting back to today, and your functional continuity, contiguity. Right. contiguity. Right. Yep. Um, I would like to know, have you seen not just the wall, but the eight terminals that are being yes. built? Under your vision, under your compromise, will the terminals be dismantled? Will the wall be dismantled? Will Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, be under the sovereignty of Palestinians, not just under their control? And will the Palestinians have their water resources back? Will they have freedom of movement? I mean, is this the kind of vision you have? Is yes. it a genuine one? Or are you talking about Sharon's plan well, I can for only tell a you what, so-called Palestinian I can only state? tell you what my proposal is, and I think it's a proposal that's today widely supported uh, within Israel. Um, that is that the ultimate security fence, I've been through not only the terminals, but the most recent terminal, the most recent high-tech terminal that was just built. Uh, I proposed actually that the security fence be placed on wheels and constantly be able to be moved consistent with Israeli security needs. The Israeli Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled last year, and Chomsky misstated it, no Israeli justice has ever said, and I challenge you to find a statement that Barack has ever said that Israeli law trumps international law. That is simply not true. What he said is that Israeli law enforces international law, but international law is not determined by a body, the International Court of Justice, which excludes Israelis from serving on it and which will not allow an Israeli ever to be a member of that court. It would be as if a southern black in the 1930s accepted as the correct statement of American constitutional law a decision by an all-white court in a case involving a black and a white man. No, uh, Israel accepts international law, enforces international law, and the goal, of course, of my peace proposal is that the security fence will eventually be dismantled when terrorism ends, but before that, it would be on the border, the way the Gaza fence is now on the border, and that water rights would be respected, there would be complete and total freedom of movement within the contiguous West Bank and between the West Bank and Gaza. Even today, Israel has given up control over the Rafah crossing. It now has a video which it can watch to see as Palestinians monitor exit and entry through the Rafah uh, gateway. That's going to be the future. And if there is a will to peace, if there is a desire to make sure that there are two states, not simply one state, a Palestinian state, then all of these issues can be resolved and will be resolved. Israel has shown the will to resolve these issues. Certainly, I support a resolution that gives dignity, gives economic viability, gives political freedom, and freedom of movement to the Palestinian people. And yes. Over East of, Jerusalem. And sovereignty uh, over me, East Jerusalem. Uh, yeah. Let yeah. me Professor quote Johnson. once again. I purposely quoted Justice Bergenthal because I know of Mr. Dershowitz's opposition to the World Court. I therefore cut, coached, uh, quoted the U.S. Justice, not the World Court, who stated that the segments of the wall being built to protect the settlements are ipso facto in violation of international humanitarian law. That's 80% of the wall. Two months later, Israel's high court stated, in contrast, that the separation wall must take into account the need to provide security for Israelis living in the West Bank, including their property rights, 
That's in direct contradiction to Justice Bergenthal's separate declaration unanimously by the World Court. That's right. And if you would like his comment about how international law, Israeli law supersedes international law in East Jerusalem uh, because Not it was annexed said. to Israel illegally, I'll be happy to provide it to you. Just send me an email. But that's not what you said. Please uh, hold. Let's go to the next. Michael uh, Sevy. I'm a second-year student at the law school. Professor Chomsky, it seems like you've done a lot of remembering and very little imagining. And Alan Dershowitz's ideas, if they seem funny to have a train or, you know, some type of other high-tech connection, at least they're creative and at least they're moving us forward. How do you deal with the issues of refugees? How would you connect Gaza and the West Bank? Or is the only solution in your mind a one-state solution? What would you do about Jerusalem? Well, as you would know if you looked at anything I'd written instead of... <laughs> if you would know if you look at anything that's written, I've been supporting a two-state settlement since the early 1970s and in print, and perhaps you can show me some of Mr. Mr. Dershowitz's uh, material in print uh, supporting it. I haven't found it. Uh, but yes, that's my position since the early 70s, all in print. Uh, as for connections, the issue, recall, at Camp David and at Taba and today is territorial in the West Bank, okay? Uh, if, uh, the, and the current proposals are exactly as I described. Uh, go through the sources I mentioned or find any other ones that you think are serious. Those are the major Israeli and Western academic sources and human rights organizations and so on. Yes, they break up the West Bank into three Bantustans, as uh, Ben Venisti said, with uh, virtually no organic connection to East Jerusalem, which is the center of Palestinian life. That's why the EU and the European uh, the European Union and Human Rights Watch and others flatly reject them. Now, it is possible. Uh, what Israel is, in fact, doing now is developing a huge infrastructure system in the West Bank with highways for Israelis and paths for Palestinians uh, so that they don't have to interact with one another, which means that this network around the West Bank, which will be annexed to Israel roughly 40 to 50 percent, uh, people can travel in it in great comfort from the suburbs around Tel Aviv, including all the water resources, including the most arable land. They can get to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. The Palestinians uh, will be following paths. Actually, I can read to you, if you like, how uh, Israeli journalists are describing that. And if you'd like to check it out for yourself, I'd suggest sometime that you take what's officially called the Palestinian road from uh, Bethlehem to Ramallah. Uh, which takes like 10 minutes on the Jewish highway. I've taken it. Uh, it's a little winding road. The dirt ro road goes right next to a wadi. If it's not raining, you're lucky if you don't fall into it. Uh, and off in the hill, you can see the paths where people are sort of moving. On the days when the uh, settlers are not traveling, the roads are empty because there's no way to get anywhere. I mean, you go in a broken down taxi cab up to a barrier and then you transport someone who needs dialysis, say, or a pregnant woman, carry them over a ditch, and then you go to another cab, and so on. Yeah, that's kind of contiguity. And again, I say the same thing. If that's reasonable, then fine. Let's impose that kind of contiguity on Israel. Okay, uh, Paul, please. Let, you have let, a let very just, brief let me uh, response. Uh, first of all, uh, listen to the words. Uh, there's an element of racism in one of the phrases we've heard today, in describing this as a Jewish highway, um, 1.2 million Israelis are Arabs. Uh, many of them are Christians. Uh, there is no such thing as a Jewish highway in Israel. There are Jewish, there are Muslim highways in Saudi Arabia. There are Muslim-only uh, roads in other parts of the world. But there is no road. There is nothing in Israel that is opened only to Jews, even synagogues. Everything is open to Israeli Arabs. Every road is open to an Israeli rare Arab. When the peace solution is finally uh, proposed, had the Camp David and Taba Accords been accepted, the Palestinians would be free to build any superhighways they choose. And indeed, Israel has offered now a superhighway and a super roadway between Gaza and Jerusalem. I'm sorry, between Gaza and Hebron. And uh, the idea of it's very difficult. I acknowledge how to connect East Jerusalem to Bethlehem, to Ramallah, and to Jericho will require a challenge. 
but people are working on it. There are creative solutions being proposed. I am waiting, along with the student who asked the question, for some creative, positive, imaginary, imaginative solutions from Professor Chomsky. All but, we're hearing <laughs> is a recitation of the past but, and a pessimistic well, notion yeah, of as long as the evil American minute. empire and Israel are involved, Thank there will be no peace. Let's go to well, the I congratulate yeah. Mr. Dershowitz again for one true statement. Uh, they are not Jewish roads, they're Israeli they're roads. That is, they are roads of the sovereigns, what I'm quoting the high court, the sovereign state of the Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora. Oh, that's, yeah, that's correct. That's but like no. saying that British Excuse roads me. are roads that's of the sovereign choice. Anglican people. Fine. I and mean, that's, Britain okay. is an Anglican yeah. country as well. We can have I, I agree please. to your qualification. There are Israeli can, roads. There are Israeli highways and Palestinian paths. If you want a creative solution, I mentioned one. Let's go to the I question. mentioned please. the Geneva Accords, the Taba Agreements, which Israel canceled. I, yes. I,